Well, welcome everyone to uh, this month's Dean Research Seminar. I'm Robin Gasser, Associate Dean Research of our faculty, um, here on behalf of the Dean, and I'm really looking forward to today's session. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'm particularly delighted today to introduce Professor Peter Mansell, who um, has been at the vet school for many years now. And uh, he's going to give his perspective on the aspects of the dairy industry in Australia. Um, just to give you a bit of background, Peter completed his Bachelor of Veterinary Science and his doctorate at the University of Melbourne. And he began to work in mixed practice um, in the Goulburn Valley and then uh, went on to complete some postgraduate and postdoctoral work uh, at the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph in Canada. Uh, in 1992, he returned to Australia to work as a senior tutor at the Rural Veterinary Unit of the University of Melbourne, together with Dr. Jacob Malmu. And later on in uh, 1994, Peter moved to Werribee to work at MVS, where he is now following promotion through the ranks. Uh, he's now professor in production animals uh, and is really passionate about teaching. Um, and veterinary education, and he's, he's really taught into all levels within the DVM curriculum and has really supervised a whole range of students, particularly research higher degree students, around 50 to date, and has published extensively in books and peer reviewed journals. In, 19, uh, in uh, 2009, he was appointed to the veterinary clinic Clinical Practitioners Board of Victoria and served as president from 2016 to 2019. And he's an active member of a range of professional bodies and societies, including the Australian Veterinary Association, the American Association for Bovine Practitioners and the American Dairy Science Association, as well as the National Mastitis Council. He's also a member of the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists in both the epidemiology and the cattle chapters. So please welcome Peter. Thank you. Over to you, Pete. Thank you, Robin. I shall share my screen and we shall see whether the technology works. How's that, Robin? Are we happy? Looks good. Excellent. OK. So, um, so thank you for that kind introduction. Um, one of the nice things about life is that things change. And uh, what seemed like a good title a while ago when I was asked to provide a title doesn't sound quite right to me now. So um, I've learned over many years uh, of teaching that students, when faced with an exam question that they don't like, just come up with an exam question they do like and answer that. Uh, and so in that spirit, I'm going to use the original title of my presentation as a starting point uh, and go a little bit tangential. So I hope you forgive me. The Australian dairy industry is a major supplier of food for domestic consumption and is also a significant source of export value for the Australian economy. The industry has been through significant structural changes over recent decades and has dealt with multiple and varied challenges in that time. But the issues that the dairy farmers of the 2020s face uh, differ markedly from those faced by the, uh, the last generation. Working with dairy farmers is fun because they are typically resourceful, they're progressive, they're hardworking, they're committed. Uh, they seek out advice and they'll try new things. Uh, but there are a lot fewer dairy farms now than there have been. In the last 20 years or so, uh, the Australian national dairy herd has dropped from 2.2 million dairy cows to about 1.4. Uh, the number of dairy herds has dropped by about 60% from nearly 13,000 uh, herds around the country to about 4,600 nowadays. So um, they're dropping fast. National milk production has dropped, but production per cow has risen from 4,900 litres per cow per year to 6,400 litres per cow per year. 
And the proportion of our national milk production, which goes to export, has also gone down. Now, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you do some completely invalid uh, extrapolation of these figures, by about 2030, if you go off the right-hand side of the graph, a typical Australian dairy cow will be producing uh, something more than 7,000 litres of milk per year. But as you can see by the declining graph, there won't actually be any of them left. So obviously things are gonna change. Uh, those trends have been pretty steady over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, the current trend is not sustainable. Something is gonna change in the next uh, five years things are either going to flatten out or they're going to go completely belly up. So sustainable can mean many things to different people. It's often used in terms of environmental sustainability or financial sustainability. And it can, be, it can mean uh, maintaining the status quo, uh, carrying on as is, or it can mean working in an environment in which continual progression and development is possible. I'd like to focus on two other aspects that have consequences for the long-term existence of the Australian dairy industry. And for want of better words, I'm gonna call them social sustainability and technical sustainability. So, so social sustainability, uh, very similar to social license. It, it, it's the broad and ongoing social license to operate. It's based on broad community support. The future of the Australian dairy industry requires public support from consumers, from observers and from regulators. Uh, as consumers, both local and global, the old maxim that the customer is always right uh, may be open to challenge, but it still holds a lot of sway in the marketplace. Uh, you're all aware of the enthusiasm of supermarkets to promote their wares, uh, according to the current public focus. Uh, it's always lower price, hormone free, permeate free, they never quite defined what they meant by permeate. Uh, you can choose your favorite term and insert it here, free, uh, natural, friendly. The, the market is driven by uh, consumer perception. As observers, even those people who don't consume dairy products have opinions on dairy production and are willing to promote their own personal agendas, whether they're based on fact or belief or emotion. And as regulators, pressure can be applied to the dairy industry uh, at all levels to force change based on any number of factors, uh, consumer perception, politics, trade considerations, et cetera, et cetera. Any industry of any flavor will not survive if it loses its social sustainability. And the sustainability of local dairy production also requires a, a continual willingness to explore new ways of dealing with old problems. Uh, and the application of established and novel methods to address emerging problems. So dairy farmers are already multi-skilled. On a daily basis, a dairy farmer uh, manages nutrition, pasture, animals, equipment, water, fertilizer, uh, people, finances, business, their, their family. Uh, underneath all of that, their primary focus is the health, welfare and production of their cows. The sustainability of the Australian dairy industry requires producers with expertise based on practical knowledge, underpinned with locally relevant research. Veterinary advisors, I'm biased, I'm a veterinarian. Veterinary advisors who are knowledgeable and broadly skilled will help our dairy producers face whatever animal health, welfare and production challenges that might arise in future decades. And we, as a, uh, the veterinary school, as the University of Melbourne, we need to keep training these advisors so that they'll have the skills needed. So back to social sustainability. Uh, some time ago, a long time ago, when I was working in practice and I had students uh, traveling in the car with me, there was plenty of time for illuminating conversation. And I do recall one student earnestly admitting that it was only uh, the week that uh, they were in MAFRA that they'd realized that cows needed to have calves in order to produce milk. And that made me think two things. The first thing it made me think was, what on hell are our kids being taught in sex education if they don't know that? Secondly, that it's critical that our students, our students at the university, are given every opportunity to connect the basic sciences that they've learnt, uh, connected to the practical application of that science in real life. 
So for anyone uh, out there who's unclear about the fundamentals of mam uh, mammalian physiology, let me give you a quick refresher. Um, mammals produce milk as a physiological response to the hormonal environment of pregnancy. Obviously, to you, I hope, they produce milk to nourish their offspring. That's the idea. In dairy production, this is flipped on its head a bit, and the production of calves is managed to initiate lactation. So we, we want the milk rather than the calf, really. The production of calves, especially female, known as heifer calves, is also necessary to provide replacements for the, those cows that inevitably leave the herd, the voluntary and involuntary culls with which we're all sadly familiar. Typical turnover within an Australian dairy herd is 20 to 30% of the herd every year. Uh, that's obviously highly variable, uh, whether the herd is increasing or decreasing in size, and there are quite, another, uh, quite a few other factors which, which might uh, play into that. So what's the issue with calves? Calves that are not used as herd replacements can't stay within the traditional Australian dairy production system. Uh, so what happens to them? Uh, they're sold as replacements for other herds. Uh, if they're of sufficient genetic quality, are healthy, are born, just happen to be born at the right time and the right place to be available and accessible to a suitable purchaser. So that's one thing that can happen to them. They can enter a different production system uh, to be grown out as beef. At an early age, they can go to early slaughter at, at an abattoir and they become bobby calf veal. Uh, at the age of uh, a week or so. Or, bluntly, they can be killed on farm. <clears throat> they just can't stay where they're born because they don't fit into the primary purpose of the, the uh, enterprise, which is the production of milk. As a rough guesstimate, uh, if there's 1.4 million dairy cows in Australia, uh, we could expect about 700,000 uh, calves born every year that aren't used as replacements uh, that have to go somewhere else, and most of them are males. What happens to those calves influences the public's perception of the dairy industry and affects the industry's social sustainability. When talking about these non-replacement calves, the terms that are used are, are words like surplus and waste and byproduct. These are all really emotive terms especially when being applied to what are obviously small, young, vulnerable animals that are undeniably photogenic and frankly cute. Uh, there is no question that the welfare of these animals is important uh, and we should be doing whatever is possible to treat them humanely. There is a fair range of viewpoints about what is meant by possible and even what is meant by humane. Some of the issues. The production of calves in Australia is highly seasonal in some areas, in Victoria, uh, and is not seasonal in others, uh, in uh, northern New South Wales, year round. Individual dairy farms have relatively small numbers of calves produced each week, and the number of births each week is itself quite variable. So it's very, it's not a, it's not a constant sort of process. Rel in Australia, relatively few abattoirs are actually able to slaughter and process young calves they don't fit into a beef chain. Uh, they're just too small to go along a beef uh, killing line. Uh, so they tend to be processed by sheep processors and not all sheep processors want to take calves or are in the right places. Uh, those abattoirs that do take calves uh, are not spread evenly around the country. And this requires a complicated system for collection and transport of calves, uh, initially from the property of origin and then consigned and eventually they get to slaughter. Uh, so the, the transport has got some uh, pretty serious issues. So how are we going to manage calf welfare? An obvious path to minimise the number of calves with compromised welfare is just to minimise the number of calves. There have been uh, plenty of studies into pharmacological ways to initiate lactation in production animals. Uh, going the best part of a century. I got back as 1944, uh, there's a journal, uh, uh, an article in the Journal of Endocrinology talking about induction of lactation in cows, um, 1944. I stopped looking after that. But these pharmacological processes have their own ethical and welfare issues. 
Uh, the process involves the repeated injection of a cocktail of hormones uh, to simulate the hormonal uh, progression of pregnancy. Uh, I can remember as a new graduate doing this on a small number of cows. This is obviously last century. In dairy cattle, frankly, the process generally doesn't work very well, and I don't think it's, uh, it's defensible. So let's put that one aside. It's much easier to reduce the number of calves that are destined for uh, low value outcomes by maximizing the proportion of calves that are suitable for other production systems. Uh, this is only uh, useful if we've got uh, alternative destinations for calves, the calves which are access to uh, herd replacement requirements. Uh, there's a few ways you can do this. Uh, it can be done by the use of sex sorted semen in which the, uh, the proportion of female sperm uh, in the semen sample and the, the semen used for insemination is much higher. It's not 50-50 male-female, it's 90-10 it's or more. Sex sorted semen is currently available commercially in Australia. Uh, you can see on the slide there, there's an ad for, for one of the mobs that uh, provide it. So it's, it's currently available um, and its use is, is established, but there are some issues. Uh, there are some issues of cost, uh, there may be some issues with conception rate under some circumstances, and not all sires are available as sex sorted semen. So if you want to go uh, sex sorted semen, then you're uh, limiting the number of sires that you have available. And even if you do that, you still get the same number of calves. You've got the same number of calves as you've got pregnancies, uh, as you've got lactations, as you've got cows. So we've still got excess calves. It's common practice to use selective breeding uh, using beef breed bulls, such that any calves that are not required as herd replacements are more easily taken into other production systems. Um, so it's, it's common for uh, dairy farmers to use uh, Herefords or Angus or uh, some other breeds uh, to produce basically beef cross calves later in the season. There is interest, uh, increasing interest in dairy beef as a way of growing a market for growing out calves of dairy origin. Uh, indeed, there's a workshop uh, being run this Thursday out at Micklem uh, to discuss this very, uh, very topic. Another approach that has been explored is extended lactation. So uh, rather than having a lactation length of about 300 days uh, with a two month dry period, so you have a calf, your cows have a calf uh, every 12 months. Instead of that, uh, where there's a requirement to have a calf per cow every year. Uh, if cows can be managed to lactate for longer, then a calf uh, need only be produced maybe every 18 months or potentially every two years. This approach reduces the number of calves uh, that need to be produced, but may have economic consequences in a dairy industry uh, like ours, which is based on the seasonal availability of pasture as the primary source of nutrition. Uh, and may also, there may also be some uh, welfare considerations for the cow by, by dragging her lactation out to those, those extreme lengths. Uh, Martin Aldist uh, and others did some work down at Ellenbank uh, Research Facility down near Warrigal uh, that suggests that this may actually have a place, uh, an application in our system. But nutritional management would need to be very good and uh, there are some considerable uh, management risks uh, involved in doing it. There's clearly a need to ensure that the uh, ensure the well-being of all calves, whether they stay on the property of origin or not. And this has been a focus of research within the Melbourne Vet School over recent years. Uh, there have been a number of research projects looking at aspects of improving calf welfare through on-farm management of calves. Uh, and to look after the calves as well as possible on on-farm, we need to promote excellent colostrum management. That's fundamental. And it's also important to recognise the, uh, the importance of both female and male calf management. Uh, you can't just uh, split them down the middle and manage them differently because they're, they are reared for whatever period of time in the same facility. And so uh, the two populations uh, represent risks to each other. There's also considerable and growing interest uh, in Australia and worldwide in new ways of managing the stressful period of uh, cow-calf separation. So uh, 
uh, dairy calves being removed from their mothers at some stage, uh, whether it's the first day, the first week, whatever. So there's some interest in, in playing around with, with that as a management technique. A big topic is the failure of the transfer of passive immunity from cow to calf. The bovine placenta does not permit the movement of immunity to the calf in utero. So each calf is born extremely vulnerable until it uh, builds up its, its own level of active immunity. So in that first stage of life, it is entirely dependent on mother's immunity, which it gets from colostrum. It's critical that calves are able to ingest sufficient colostrum of good quality, high immunoglobulin concentration within the first 12 hours of life. That time limit is determined by the, the uh, physiological closure of the calf gut. So in the first 12 hours of life, it is able to absorb basically all the immunoglobulin that the calf can ingest. From 12 hours onwards, that ability to absorb the immunoglobulins plummets. So after 24 to 36 hours, it, uh, it doesn't matter how much colostrum you put down, it doesn't get, it doesn't get absorbed by the calf, it just passively passes through the, the GI tract. The failure of a calf to acquire uh, passive immunity from its mother is called failure of passive transfer, uh, abbreviated as FPC on other slides. The three most important things about calf management, and I'm being uh, somewhat facetious here, but there are three important things about calf management, and they are colostrum, colostrum, and colostrum. It's that big. So despite the recognition of the importance of colostrum intake in newborn dairy calves, uh, we still struggle to achieve adequate intakes in many calves in many herds. Given the importance of colostrum, this is a huge area for improvement. Knowing how to improve things requires a good understanding of the hurdles to best practice. We've done a considerable amount of work looking at the prevalence of uh, failure of passive transfer in Victorian dairy herds. If you want a, a sort of global number, uh, 20 to 30 percent of calves uh, would be classified as having failure of passive transfer. Work done by uh, Ash Phipps, Gemma Chuck, Nat Roadnight, Mono Apalab, uh, all uh, past postgraduates of ours, have given us a better understanding of which herds have problems and how and why the problems exist in particular circumstances. For example, uh, Ash Phipps, uh, one of the, the uh, reprints on the page there, uh, his work was looking, at, he looked at the quality of colostrum and he showed that there is um, substantial room for improving the quality of colostrum being fed to replacement heifer calves. Uh, visual assessment of, uh, of colostrum is a poor indicator of colostrum quality. You can't look at the stuff and decide, geez, that looks rich and creamy or not. It's, uh, visual assessment is no good. Uh, only 58% of samples that Ash looked at uh, satisfied the requirements, uh, the, the recommendations for total plate count and total coliform count, uh, a measure of the bacterial load of, of the colostrum that the calf is ingesting. Only 23% of the samples he tested met all the recommendations of total plate count, total coliform count, and uh, immunoglobulin uh, concentration as measured by a brick refractometer. Less than a quarter. So there are large numbers of calves in the, uh, in the local dairy herd who are at risk of failure of passive transfer, uh, which has consequences, as I'll show you in a minute. So, so the work done by these postgrads uh, has really uh, improved our ability to promote better colostrum management to dairy farmers, um, both the application of existing knowledge and getting local knowledge. Another aspect of dairy management which has attracted specific attention more recently is the perceived stresses uh, that early life separation places on both cow and calf. Nat Roadnight, who's uh, just uh, recently completed a PhD, has studied how delayed or repeated temporary separation of cows from their calves can affect uh, the behaviour of both and how this may be applicable as a way of reducing the stress of separation. Uh, there are a multitude of factors which remain to be explored, uh, and this is a, a, a developing area. Uh, but it's an approach uh, to calf management that is generating considerable interest uh, in Australia and overseas. 
whether it's possible for commercial dairy farmers to balance the bonding of cow and calf with the challenging logistics of uh, milking those same cows each day uh, is a bit of a fascinating journey. Uh, how farmers can manage. There are already farmers in Australia who are uh, leaving calves on cows for some days or parts of days for some time. So it is possible. It's also uh, proved worthwhile to quantify some of the benefits of good heifer management. Uh, Gemma Chuck, who uh, used to work down in Western Vic uh, West Victoria, uh, postgraduate student, dairy resident of ours, uh, is now based in Queensland. Uh, Gemma did an extensive long-term study uh, in six West Victorian dairy herds that followed dairy calves from birth through to the end of their first lactation. So this, this, is, this is a big undertaking. This is a long-term study. Her work showed the critical importance of careful management of replacement heifers with events, even during the first few weeks of life, having far reaching consequences for uh, the reproduction and production the performance of those animals as they grew uh, to, to adults. This work highlighted how little we understand about the mechanisms by which early life events can have long term physiological effects. So. Um, the importance of early life management and the implications that poor management can have on milking herd performance. Uh, what you do with a dairy calf in the first few weeks of its life realistically sets it up for the first years of its life, um, which is uh, uh, physiologically, it's fascinating. The management of bobby calves uh, after they leave the farm gate uh, is subject to considerable regulation. Uh, there's a lot of regulation here. Remember that uh, bobby calves are calves that are less than 30 days of age, that weigh less than uh, 80 kilos, and which are not accompanied by their mothers. In Victoria, bobby calves being transported for sale or slaughter must be at least five days of age, unless they're going to a calf rearing farm, but it's a bit specialised. So let's say they must be five days of age, they must be fit and healthy, and they must have been adequately fed within six hours of departure from their farm of origin. So minimum uh, six hours before they, or maximum six hours before they leave the farm. Uh, in reality, this is not quite so clear cut as it seems. Um, documentation of the age of the calf relies on conscientious record keeping by the herd owner. Uh, and the definition of what is fit and healthy is, is not specified. While the documentation describes both standards, standards are what must be done, and guidelines, what should be done, um, not everybody, as we know, treats guidelines with respect. A photograph I took in the car park just down the road from my place, not my car. Um, the ability to prosecute those who don't meet standard requires a well-documented evidentiary basis. So we've got a, a regulated system of calf transport, which has been based on some pretty flimsy uh, evidence. The minimum age requirement for calf transport of five days is hard to police. <clears throat> at present, uh, it relies on the conscientious keeping of records of birth at the property of origin by the farmer. And it uh, probably comes as no surprise to any of us that not all farmers are very good at keeping good records, especially during what is the busiest time of year. You've got uh, cows, you've got calves, uh, you haven't slept for weeks. Uh, it's hard to remember uh, which calf was born which day and how old it is. And then they all go into a calf rearing facility uh, for some period of time and you're not quite sure how long they've been in there. As part of her PhD studies, Nat Romite did a series of studies trying to identify a reliable way to document calf age based on a variety of physiological parameters, uh, taking blood and looking at uh, different statistical uh, um, iterations of, of the parameters, trying to work out uh, if we can take a blood sample and say, this calf is five days old, or this calf is seven days old, or whatever. Uh, sadly, it didn't work, uh, no success. It's even harder to establish practical indicators of what is acceptable and unacceptable welfare of dairy calves prior to or subsequent to transportation. Uh, so uh, there is no easy uh, blood test which says this calf 
uh, has compromised welfare. In an attempt to, uh, to contribute to the improving of this situation, uh, as a group, we were asked to conduct a controlled study to provide some scientific basis for a regulated limit for time off feed. Um, so time off feed is the period between when the calf last had a feed, had a drink, and the time that it is either uh, fed again at the abattoir, which happens very rarely, uh, or is slaughtered. So that's the time off feed from last feed to a time of slaughter. And the, the, it was a regulatory limit for, um, with a view to beyond this, it opens the possibility of prosecution. So it wasn't uh, assessing best practice, it was assessing a regulatory limit. Uh, this involved a lot of planning, uh, bleeding calves in the middle of the night by torchlight in the freezing rain, uh, loading and unloading calves onto a truck, uh, a commercial truck, driven by a commercial truck driver who uh, <coughs> we merrily waved him goodbye and he headed off on a predetermined scenic tour to simulate commercial road transport and he came back and we really bled cars. Great fun. Uh, it prov provided the best data available for the purpose. The end result was that there is actually little evidence of physiological stress in calves transported under good commercial conditions if they are prepared well and managed appropriately. Uh, and uh, this was done with, um, on, a, on a commercial dairy farm uh, using their calves. Uh, it was as realistic as we could make it uh, and the calves coped really well. The study attracted a lot of vitriolic comment <clears throat> and uh, my dear colleague, Andrew Fisher, faced that bravely uh, and took it uh, on our collective behalf, and which just proves that Andrew is a top bloke. Uh, it wasn't much fun. We've conducted a series of studies collecting blood from calves both in Lairidge at the abattoirs and immediately after slaughter in commercial calf abattoirs to try to explore associations with time and distance of transport uh, between property of origin and abattoir. It's surprisingly difficult to collect robust data on the distance of transport of calves. Uh, because the trucks have to go from farm to farm, from, uh, from calf yard to calf yard, uh, they're not traced. The time of transportation is a little easier to ascertain using scanned NLIS tag data because calves are scanned when they go on the truck and they're scanned when they come off the truck at the abattoir. So we know uh, from that time date stamp, we know how long they've been on the truck, but we don't know how far they've traveled in that truck. The data suggests that at least over the distances and times of transport experienced by calves slaughtered in Victoria, calves are remarkably resilient, even though they're five, six, seven, ten days of age. It's important to recognise the limitations of some of this data, but our results uh, give me considerable reassurance that the current practices are defensible, which is a good thing. Some interesting spin-offs from our work in abattoirs have included as yet unpublished studies on the pathogen load in the gastrointestinal tract of these uh, transported calves. We hope to further explore associations between on-farm and off-farm management of calves and the risk of carcass, contam carcass contamination uh, from the gut uh, bacteria that they're carrying. It may be that calves who are more stressed um, are apparently normal, but have a higher load of gut pathogens, and that might be uh, a higher risk for carcass contamination. We've also explored the utility of the collection of bobby calf serum uh, immediately post slaughter as a way to investigate disease distribution in properties of origin. That's got some real logistical advantages. Remembering that calves acquire passive immunity from colostrum, the serum of these bobby calves is a potentially easy way to survey the immune status of the cows on the calf's property of origin. Um, so, and we, we've done a little bit of work uh, looking at um, certainly mycoplasma and we're looking at others. Uh, there is still much to do. I mentioned at the start of this presentation that the sustainability of local dairy production also requires a continual willingness to explore new ways of dealing with old problems and the application of methods to address emerging problems. 
and that a sustainable dairy industry needs the support of local, skilled, practical advisors drawing on knowledge and understanding that is locally relevant. Over the years, we've provided postgraduate training to many people, not mentioned in the previous slides, um, addressing a wide variety of research topics of relevance. Uh, it began in earnest, I think, in the early 1980s, probably late 70s, early 80s, with the establishment of the Rural Veterinary Unit based in the Mafra Vet Centre under the leadership of uh, Jacob Melman. It has progressed through a series of cohorts of master's level training programs, the Dairy Master's Program, which was uh, set up and run by uh, Dr. Paul M. Breitling, and subsequently the Dairy Residence Program, which was uh, initially initiated by uh, Dr. Michael Pyman and has been continued by David Beggs and myself since, in which rural veterinarians in place gain skills in field research and application whilst remaining in dairy focused veterinary practice. So they are still within the industry, they're doing projects which are of value to their local industry. Uh, and it would be fun to, uh, to describe the structure of this program and the resultant research projects that have been completed uh, at some stage. What I would like to do um, very quickly, and I don't actually intend to go through these in particular detail, um, but just running through the slides, we currently have six dairy residents uh, working with us. Uh, and they've all got research projects which they're doing in their, uh, in their local environment. These projects are due for completion. Uh, they've got out of whack, but over the next 12 months or so, some of them are just finishing, some of them won't be finished for a little while. Um, but their completion seminars will be advertised and we would uh, love to have as many people come along and ask uh, questions uh, as possible. Sarah Bolton, who is based within Dairy Australia, uh, is looking at the effects of milk feeding volume and frequency on dairy calf health and welfare. So she's, uh, she's working on a large herd and uh, they've managed to split up calves to see um, frequency of feeding, automated feeding, uh, foster, foster feeding on cows, uh, looking at uh, weight gains subsequent to that. Uh, Tom Lockman, who's a veterinarian based in private practice in Colac, uh, is just finishing up a study looking at uh, gastrointestinal parasite uh, prevalence within uh, dairy cows and trying to ascertain, uh, get a better handle on the profile of the parasites and also um, looking at the, uh, the utility of treating uh, adult cows for the gastrointestinal parasitism. Jack Dudley, who's a veterinarian based at Druin, has been looking at uh, commercial on-farm milk culture systems. So there are, there's equipment around where farmers can take milk samples and instead of uh, taking the time to send it to the lab and waiting for the results to come back, there are desktop machines nowadays which, uh, which can give an answer about uh, what bacteria are growing in the milk. Um, so uh, Jack is, is looking at the utility of those machines. Lucy Collins, uh, based down the Western District, uh, has gone, uh, she thinks, a little left field in that she's, she's doing more sort of social uh, research, looking at uh, opportunities for enhancing welfare in the Australian dairy industry. And she's, she's doing this through social media, doing uh, surveys, uh, looking at uh, what, what people think of as when they think of the ideal dairy farm. What do they think uh, heaven would be like on a dairy farm? Uh, and uh, relating that to what reality is and whether they've got realistic or not uh, perceptions. Kate Mitchell, uh, veterinarian down at Tasmania, uh, now down at Tasmania, uh, was, is looking at the effect of post-sale management practices on dairy herd beef fertility, uh, bull fertility, sorry. Uh, so this is uh, looking at uh, the semen quality of bulls uh, that go from where they've been reared and then they get sold to uh, farms where they're gonna be used as paddock bulls. Uh, Kate's looking at um, the changes of fertility that can happen uh, with, that, uh, with that transition from one property to another and whether it actually has uh, serious considerations uh, for the fertility of those bulls. And finally, Jane Woolacott, uh, Bega was in private practice, is, is now uh, working for Dairy Australia based in Bega. Uh, using the technique of herd environmental culture, which basically means collecting poo from the yard 
rather than from cows, uh, looking at the, uh, the use of antibiograms uh, to predict likely uh, resistance patterns, specifically in salmonella uh, in dairy herds in southeastern Australia. Um, we've got a lovely video of, um, of Jane running around yards with a broom, um, sweeping up poo. This is what cattle vets do. So in conclusion, uh, despite the alarming trend of herd numbers I referred to earlier in this presentation, uh, I'm not anticipating that the Australian dairy industry will disappear sometime around 2030. Uh, I am expecting it will face ongoing and emerging challenges, but I'm confident that we're reasonably well placed to support it uh, facing those challenges. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I would also like to, uh, just while it's on the slide there, uh, draw your attention to the fact that uh, we have a postgraduate seminar uh, starting at one o'clock. So I'm glad to have finished a little bit early uh, so that you can uh, grab a cup of tea and a bicky and then come back uh, to see that seminar. So Robin, on that, I'll, uh, I'll hand, up, hand oh, it back to you. For, yeah, thanks, Peter. That was, that was fantastic. A great overview over different relevant areas that um, we've learned about and certainly given, given us some insight. Uh, I suppose I just to kick off, I'd I'd have a, a question regarding sex semen. I mean, what what do you see the main risks are? You know, with the I suppose with the longer term, just a longer term perspective on the use of sex semen, because it would seem that there's a risk of genetic homogenisation to some extent. Yeah, look, I, I think you're right, Robin. That um, the I think the main issue with, with sex sorted semen is that uh, it's not available for all sires. And we, we already have concerns about the, uh, the restriction of the genetic basis for dairy cattle the world over, frankly, um, but in Australia as well. So I think um, sex sorted semen, if, if that further limits the number of bulls or the range of bulls which are, are available for use as AI, um, that's a problem, yeah. um, but it, it, it certainly as a way of uh, of massively decreasing the number of uh, male calves which are born, which have to find places to go. Um, uh, it, it's got some definite advantages. Yeah, and and is it true that there? I mean, Landline was reporting that about one quarter of properties are already using sex semen. Is that true? Uh, I I don't know that. Don't know the figures. Um, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I'm. I think it would be fair to say that they're not using it on all their cattle. They're probably using sex sorted semen uh, strategically uh, for particular classes. So they might use them for heifers, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I. I think it would be. I would be surprised if it was a quarter of all dairy cows were being mated with sex sorted semen. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's certainly it, it's it's no longer a niche product. It's it's standard. It's out there. Um, Sandra Liano has, has has a question. I'll ask Sandra to to ask the question live. Um, Sandra, thank you. Um, what I was actually suggesting is, can't they use GPS tracking on the vehicles that are carrying the calves, so that they could actually look at both location they've gone to and that could give information perhaps there's certain conditions during transport that may be more stressful such as windy roads or heat etc uh yeah sandra look the short answer is yes um it takes nothing you know we've all got gps units in our phones now so um the the, the problem from a research point of view is getting permission to do that and actually getting the data um, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of political sensitivity working with bobby calves. There's a lot of political. I, I didn't show any pictures of our work in abattoirs uh, because if I took a camera into an abattoir, uh, that'd be the last time I went to the abattoir. Um, not because there's anything terribly terrible going on there, um, but they're just very very sensitive. Um, so the the short answer is yes. Um, there is the potential to use GPS. There's, there is a lot of interest, uh, there's a lot of potential for looking at specific transportation um, conditions, which are more or less stressful, um, uh, but it's work that's still to be done. Yeah. 
Oh, thanks for that. Um, Andrew Fisher has a has a query, Andrew. You're live, Andrew. I, I can't hear Andrew, but I can see his uh, his question. So he said, uh, what, what do you what do you see as the future with respect to milk from real cows versus plant based milk versus bioreactor milk that is otherwise indistinguishable from real milk? Um, I did actually have a slide in my presentation about uh, alternative milks and I took it out because I thought it was probably um, getting a little bit too tangential even for me. Andrew, I, I think the, um, the value of milk alternatives, um, almond milk, soy milk, the like, um, it's probably, dare I say, I, I still think it's a, a bit of a niche market. It's certainly a market. Uh, there are certainly people who, uh, who cannot drink milk. There are people who do not wish to drink milk, uh, but they like the idea of drinking emulsified nut fluid. Um, I got no problems with that. Um, I think to think that um, plant-based milks are going to take over from uh, cow origin milk, uh, I don't think I'm going to live long enough, but you know, that's a challenge to somebody to make sure it happens. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Marshall Lighthouse has a question. Marshall? You're on mute at the moment. Any, anyway. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, uh, Marshall. Yes. Ah. Okay. Um, Peter, uh, is the trend that you showed us early on that's happening in Australia, uh, happening in other major dairy uh, countries, let's say New Zealand or uh, in Europe, uh, are the herd sizes plummeting? Is there, um, where, where's the milk going to come from? Um, if the, even if the, the trend has gone as far as it has. So the, the herd sizes, uh, the, the, the size of individual herds is increasing, if anything. Um, the number of herds is decreasing. The amount of milk uh, that's produced uh, the world over um, is not going down. Uh, it, there's, there's insufficient dairy product uh, to, to feed our growing billions. Um, in New Zealand, uh, I think it, uh, it's probably not quite as, I haven't got the figures in front of me, but I, I think it's probably not as uh, significant a decline in herd numbers as Australia. Um, uh, North America and Europe uh, dairy herds are subject to a lot of political um, shenanigans, so uh, the numbers are are subject to other things as well. Uh, in Australia, you know, we had uh, deregulation. Uh, saw from the, the the map on one of my slides. There's a little piece of uh, Australian dairy industry up in far north Queensland, and there's dairy industry in Western Australia, and there's dairy industry in South Australia. Um, but it's the the Australian dairy industry is slowly but surely surely contracting towards Victoria. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to dairy farm in those isolated areas uh, because of the fragmentation. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult for uh, those dairy farmers to receive the technical and expert support that they need um, because a, a, a veterinary practice that used to support, uh, used to uh, service 200 herds is now supporting 50 herds or 40 herds or 20 herds. And at some stage, those practices just there's not enough critical mass to keep them keep them expert in in the in the field. Thanks for that, Marshall. Pete, um, Said has has a question regarding uh, typing of bacteria. Said, yeah, thank you, Peter. Nice talk. Uh, you mentioned in the third last slide that farmer nowadays can use a special machine to determine the type of bacteria on the farm without sending sample to the lab. Can you uh, please elaborate on the principle of these devices? How does it work? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so that there's there's a number of different machines around automated processes, robotic um, culturing of of uh, bacteria from milk. Uh, I don't think there's an established standard method, uh, but they're generally looking at phenotype uh, of of the bacteria and cross referencing uh, the phenotypes to databases of known pathogens. Uh, so it's, do they, uh, sorry, Peter, do they identify different strain and species? Because I'm aware of the AT pays analysis to determine the total count. Yeah, um, they're, they're generally not that specific. Uh, so the, the different machineries and the different program, uh, the different methodologies will go down to different levels of, of identification. Um, and some are better than others. And so that's that's why uh, you know, Jack is looking at one of the, the, the master test system uh, to see whether it's actually accurate or not uh, in commercial dairy herds with the pathogens that are likely to, to be seen uh, from here. Thank you. Uh, John, you've got a question, John. Yeah, Do thank you, Robin. Yeah. Uh, you can hear me, can you? Yep. Yep. Lovely. I'm um, Peter, this um, isn't something you spoke about, but I, I was sitting here listening to your interesting talk. And um, so thank you for that. Um, my question was about, what about genetically modified cows? Um, I spent some time working at the Rosalind Institute in Edinburgh, and of course they were making all kinds of genetically modified um, animals. And I do actually remember writing a grant proposal at one time to make, um, to develop cows that would be genetically modified so they would be resistant to foot and mouth. And of course we've had threats from foot and mouth just recently, and that would be a major um, devastating infection for the dairy industry. Um, I've lost track though of where the idea of GM cows has got to or whether it's even is happening, but are the GM cows coming along and um, will they be used in the dairy industry? And do you think public will accept the milk from GM cows? Where's that all got to? Um, gosh, there's a lot of politically loaded questions in there, John. Um, I, uh, and I'll, I'll say this as personal, this is my personal opinion. Um, it's not based on anything other than far too long on the planet. Um, I don't think that the Australian, my, my current view is that the, the Australian market is unlikely to accept genetically modified cows um, or milk from genetically modified cows. I think it's, it's too loaded with, with other baggage. Um, but similarly, I don't think um, that the use of genetically modified cows uh, is likely to be a serious issue for, or, or a serious um, impetus for the dairy industry um, in the short term. I think there's been so much genetic uh, progress made by using natural selection uh, and, and the the dairy industry is a fantastic example of using natural selection, uh, sire selection, cow selection, um, look, looking at genotypes uh, in terms of selection. I don't think uh, GM is, is probably necessary. How long it would take to, uh, to convert a national herd across to being resistant to FMD? Um, yep, I don't think I'll live that long. Okay, thanks, Peter. Uh, Glenn, Glenn has a question regarding mortality. Calf mortality, Glenn. G'day, Peter. Um, I think uh, you were probably getting at this with the discussion of failure of passive transfer, but how, how big an issue is calf mortality? What, or is that too politically loaded to talk about? Oh, no, we're used to politically loaded questions, Glenn. Thank you. Um, uh, look, it, I, I, I tried to find some data on calf mortality for the national herd. And I couldn't find anything that I considered to be reliable. Uh, the, clearly, if you say there's 1.4 million cows, uh, if they all got pregnant, then you've got 1.4 million calves. And if half of them are male, you've got 700,000 male, car, uh, 700, male calves. Um, what is the percentage of deaths, uh, perinatal uh, or, or um, parturient deaths in cows? Um, I'm not sure we've got really good data uh, on that. Uh, it's significant. Um, you know, dead, dead calves are common, um, but is it 5% or 
or 20%. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure there's the data out there. Thanks. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, I think we'll, uh, I mean, there are a couple of, couple of questions still remaining, but I, I think we'll probably have to close off here because of the, the seminar coming up and, and just to give people a bit of a bit of a break before they go into the postgraduate seminar. But I, it just remains for, for us to thank Pete for what was a really great seminar with a lot of, a lot of um, discussion, which was fantastic. So thanks again, Pete, and thanks to everyone for, for attending. I'd just like to make you aware of the next seminar, which will be on the 11th of October. Um, and Lee Skerritt will be talking about some of his uh, research and, and uh, some of the research of his colleagues as well. So thanks for attending today and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, folks.